I'm a mom of a four-year-old and I'm expecting my second child later this year. God bless. I'm a fan of your blog. It's been very helpful in the process of adjusting my thinking toward business. Does being ambitious or wanting more success mean you are ungrateful for the current gifts in your life? Is it possible to be fully grateful for the current blessings you have and still pursue the six-figure income, the fame, the entrepreneurship, etc., with abandon? Want to know my answer? Do you? Yes! 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 yes. Wait, you know who else says yes? Here's the reason why I love this question. I'm so happy that it came up. One of the biggest challenges that most of us go through when we're starting to explore spirituality and discovering the whole idea of being super grateful for what you have is we can feel guilty about wanting more. It's almost as if, oh, I really have to just, you know, be okay with everything I have now, which is great, but it's human to want to create. It's human to want to grow, to want to explore, to expand and take in more. And I just want to make a little note here. You know, wanting more doesn't always equate to materialism. It doesn't always mean toys. You could want to touch more lives. You could want to expand your ability to love. So wanting more in and of itself is nothing that you should shy away from. And I absolutely believe with my heart and soul that you can be extremely grateful for what you have and go balls to the wall with your dreams. So I have a few strategies to share with you that will help you accomplish this. In my lovely book called Make Every Man Want You, How to Be So Irresistible You'll Barely Keep From Dating Yourself, which by the way, we're going to give you a free audio download, Missy, just because you asked such a great question. I talk about a concept called this is it. This is it really means that you treat this moment like it's the most amazing moment of your life. You look around in your world and you just make it the best it can possibly be. So in short, wherever you're at, that's where the party is. So if you find yourself standing in line at a bank and there's a really long line and everyone else is cranky, this is it. This is your moment. So you're going to party with it. You're going to hang out. You're going to have a great time. Talk to people on the line. Really appreciate where you're at. But that doesn't stop you. The whole this is it mentality doesn't stop you from having big dreams that you're also going to pursue. So it's a matter of just finding that balance, but you can absolutely do it. And don't let anyone tell you that uh, you're ungrateful for what you have if you have big dreams and ambitions. So one more little note, and it's about complaining. This is a great way to just basically check yourself before you wreck yourself. Chickity chickity, check yourself before you wreck yourself. If you catch yourself complaining, you've slipped out of the modality of being grateful for what you have, and it's gonna be really hard to really attract great things or be really ambitious or have the energy you need to achieve those big dreams. So use complaining as a bit of a barometer. If you find yourself saying, oh, this sucks, my current client sucks, my boyfriend sucks, blah, 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 not so good. Stop it, don't beat yourself up, but just get back into the grateful mode and keep kicking ass toward your dreams. If you've ever lost motivation because you're afraid your dreams are just too unrealistic, this one is for you. Today's question comes from Brie who writes, Hey Marie, you're such an inspiration. I so respect your advice. Thank you. Here's my situation. My whole life I've had big dreams and lots of ambition. Then this little word started to pop up from people around me, unrealistic. For example, I wanted to work in publishing and was told that was unrealistic. There were so many obstacles and so few jobs. However, I now work for the second largest publishing company in the world but there's a new dream I want to pursue and I can already hear the cacophony of voices in my head insisting this dream is unrealistic. A certain level of realism is necessary, but too much can create self-doubt. So Marie, how do I handle not only hearing from others how unrealistic my dream is, but also not let myself drown out my own desires? Thank you so much, Brie. I love this question so much, Brie. Every single one of us who both dreams and creates things 
faces voices of dissent, both from people that we know, from people that we don't know, and very often the most deadly comes from within. And if we don't take a thoughtful, conscious approach to taking on our unrealistic dreams, they just ain't gonna happen. But if you are up for the challenge, and I think you are, here are five steps that can help. Step number one is frame your dream. And here's what this means. We can't become what we can't envision. So when I say frame your dream, what I mean is I want you to take a picture of it in your mind's eye in vivid, specific detail. And then what I want you to do is translate that picture into words, meaning write down that big unrealistic dream. And I know that you may have heard about the power of writing things down before, but the truth is most people just don't do it, which is so crazy because the research is conclusive on this. There was a study done by Dr. Gail Matthews that shows that you are 42% more likely to achieve your goals if you write them down. So what I want you to do is whip out your journal or hop on that keyboard and get writing. Step number two is filter opinions and fend off negativity. You've got to take responsibility for the energy that you allow in your life. I want you to fend off negativity as much as humanly possible. You know, we know so much more about the brain than we did just 20 years ago. Neuroscience has taught us incredible things, like that our brains are continuously shaped by our thoughts and our experiences. And you know this to be true. I mean, negativity is one of the most toxic forces on the planet. It's toxic for your brain, for your nervous system, and for your ability to stay motivated. So do me this favor, okay? Do not solicit or listen to the opinions of people who are notorious for just being Debbie Downers. The one mistake that I've seen people make consistently is they almost habitually talk to the exact person who is the most likely to shoot them down and make them feel like crap. So don't do that. And here's another key. I want you to Always, always, always consider the source. Meaning, don't put a lot of stock into other people's opinions unless they're actually out there consistently taking risks and being brave and actually making things happen. I mean, if you think about it, let's say, I don't know, you wanted to climb Mount Everest. Would you ever take advice from someone who's never even attempted the summit? No, of course not. That would be crazy. So don't take advice from anyone unless you really think it through. And I want you to ask, has this person achieved an unrealistic or impossible dream? Are they taking meaningful risks on a consistent basis? Do you admire who they are, how they live, and what they contribute? If not, do not use them as a sounding board for your idea. Step number three is flood yourself with positive examples. So once you've removed the negative outputs as best as you can, step number three is all about feeding your mind and surrounding yourself with positive stories on a consistent basis of other people who have achieved unrealistic dreams. So think about Helen Keller, for example, who was blind and deaf by the age of two, yet with the help of teachers, she created this extraordinary literary career, writing hundreds of speeches and essays and books. And there are thousands of biographies at the library or even on Netflix. And the great thing that I love about biographies is you also get a chance to witness other people's stumbles and their falls and all the failures that they experience along the way, which of course, Stumbles and falls and failures, those are inevitable for all of us. And you know, it's worth noting that just about anyone whose achievements are worthy of a biography or a documentary probably had an unrealistic dream. So do this for me. Feed your mind examples of people who speak out and stand up for what they believe in and make change happen. Step number four is fast forward. So if you've watched the show for any amount of time, you know this, I love end of life studies. And here's what we know for a fact. When you're on your deathbed, you couldn't care less about what anybody who says your dreams are unrealistic says. I mean, Bronnie Ware's research tells us this very, very clearly, that the single biggest regret people have when they're about to pass is this. I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself not the life others expected of me. 
So Brie, my friend, stop worrying about what other people might think or say about how unrealistic your dream is. It really does not matter. The only thing that matters is what you do about it now. Step number five is focus on action. So this, my friend, is the most important step of all. Action is the antidote to fear. And you don't have to take perfect action. You just need to take any action, brick by brick, inch by inch, step by step. That is how all great things are achieved. And you know my mantra, I believe everything is figure outable. And the best way to figure anything out is through action-based learning. So one more thing before we wrap up, Brie. Unrealistic dreams are totally where it's at. That's where all the growth and the excitement in life comes from. After all, what other kind of dreams are there? Dreams like this? Marie, you will not believe the dream I had last night. So reasonable. I'm shopping, I'm getting all my normal vegetables, but they didn't have avocados. I asked the manager, he brought me some from the back. So realistic, so inspiring. Wow, that uh, sounds inspiring. I mean, you could do that. I think, I think you can make that happen. So Brie, there you have it. Five steps to help you bring your unrealistic dreams to life. And if you ever start to waver, remember this tweetable. If someone tells you your big dream is unrealistic, that's a sure sign you should go for it. Chapter 14 talks about the right and wrong way to manifest. And I thought Mm. this was really awesome because, again, for folks like you and I, who tend to then attract folks like you and I, meaning (laughs) very hard workers, people who put their nose to the grindstone, we get it done no matter what, right? (laughs) Even if you don't like the word manifesting, just this notion of having more ease in your life, of bringing things into your life that you don't necessarily Mm -hmm. pound your face against the ground for every single day until your eyeballs fall out. So talk to me about a little bit of the the wrong way and the right way to manifest for those who may want a little more ease. Yeah. Great question. So let me um, draw a distinction between the importance of dreaming and uh, the power of manifesting. So dreaming in terms of not what you're doing at night, but dreaming and giving yourself permission to desire things to have incredible, magical things occur in your life. Giving yourself permission to let your mind, body, and spirit wander into the future and to imagine a life that really lights you up. That's so important because those dreams are deeply connected to your soul. Like you, you won't dream about something that's not meant for you. I'm not dreaming right now about a uh, penthouse apartment in New York City. I don't want to live there right now. So that's not going to come to me. But, you know, when you allow yourself and your mind and spirit to wander forward and just allow yourself and give yourself permission to imagine, what's amazing is you plant a beacon out into the future. And that beacon, whether it's a beach house or it's a loving relationship or it's uh, healing past trauma or it's launching your dream business or it's just waking up and being happier and healthier and surrounded by all these amazing people. Whatever that dream is, you got to allow yourself to dream it because it acts as a mechanism that starts to pull you toward it and it it will pull you through your fear. It will create tension in your life because it's going to make you start to wake up and pay attention to it. That's where a vision board comes in. And a vision board, yeah, Most of us make a vision board and we put up the beach house or the Range Rover or the amazing log cabin or the trip to Disney World or the dream business that we want, whatever it is the things are that we want, the loving relationship. But then this is where we make the biggest mistake because manifesting isn't the dream. Manifesting is the bridge between where you are and where you want to go. Mm. manifesting is the bricks that form the pathway that connect you there. And most of us have been led to believe that we need to sit quietly and with vibrational force feel ourselves sitting on the deck of that beach house and how it's going to feel when the wind is in our hair. And what happens when you do it that way 
is that you socialize your mind and body to the end. When the fact is, it's going to be a bazillion little irritating steps that get you there. Yes. And we skip that part. So I love this. I, I just want to underscore this because when we were doing the Everything is Figure Outable book tour and I did this event and I had people close their eyes and visualize themselves figuring it out, whatever their their dream was, we actually did that. I was like, I want to see, I want you to see yourself taking those steps. And I loved how you broke this down in the book. I thought it was so great because yeah, it's one thing to go, yay, we crossed the finish line and there's the house or the relationship or the health or the trip or whatever. Right. But to rehearse in your mind's eye, emotionally, visually, intellectually, seeing yourself doing the steps. So if it's writing mm -hmm. a book, you know, sitting at your table and maybe sweating a little because you don't think you're a very good writer, but showing up anyway, or getting up when the alarm yep. goes off and putting your sneakers on and all of those different little micro actions, even if it's a healthy relationship. For me, there's been times where if what I want to shift and change is a reaction that I've had to something, seeing myself mm with the same situation that could trigger me in the past and visualizing myself behaving differently, feeling differently, watching it. Those are the steps that help me create that shift where yes. it actually happens. So I just yes. wanted to praise you, acknowledge you, and underscore how awesome this is because your mind is so powerful. Our brains are so incredibly miraculous, but we're not given the instruction kits on yes. how to use them. Yes, exactly. So, you know, you want to launch a business, visualize yourself telling your friends you can't come out tonight because you're going to work on something. Visualize yourself hitting that post and then feeling the fear that people are going to judge you when you start posting about something different than your kids or your dream vacations and you start posting about your business. Visualize yourself spending a Saturday while the kids are playing soccer working on something. Visualize yourself hearing no and feeling discouraged and then picking up the phone and making the next phone call. There's something called the Zygarnik effect in your brain. It's like a little to-do list, a checklist that your brain keeps intact in your mind. And your brain, once you start to socialize your mind, body, and spirit to all these little irritating steps, like you want to run a marathon, don't visualize a finish, visualize yourself at mile 11 on a training run and it starts to rain and your earbud batteries die and you keep going. Yes. When you do that, what you're doing is you're smoothing out your resistance to all this work that it's going to require to make this stuff happen. Because you are capable. You can figure it out. And you can use uh, simple tools backed by science to lower the resistance in your body and mind to actually doing the things that you've never done before. I mean, when, we, when I read this chapter in the audiobook, I was literally almost... <gasps> as I read it. And uh, I said to my team afterwards, we need to re-record that. They were like, are you kidding me? So let's see if I can get through this. <sighs> Dreams don't disappear. You were born with them and they are, I can say, I can't even get through this. <laughs> Dreams don't disappear. You were born with them and they are meant for you. That means you take them with you wherever you go in whatever version of yourself you create. So you might as well stop running and start leaning into them. You might as well see and hear and feel all the clues of your life that it's trying to give you about who you're destined to be. We are called in different ways to be the best and highest versions of ourselves. We want to high-five marriage. We want to be high-five parents. We want high-five friendships and a high-five career. Wherever there is a dream in your life, trust that you can high-five your way to it. And know that I'm still right here beside you, and so is Marie, raising our hand in celebration with you. High five, my friend. We see you. We believe in you. Now it's your turn to believe in yourself and go make your dreams come true. <laughs> I don't dream really big about my company development. I don't want a Porsche or to hire people or to be the chief general manager person. I'm interested in a life with a really good steady income, bit of a paradox when having a company, and doing what I like to do on my own while still having enough time for people I care about. So in general, 
Is not having a plan for a big business with 20 plus workers a really bad thing? Regards from Poland, smiley face, Julia. Julia, I absolutely love this question because it gives me a chance to talk about something I don't get a chance to talk about nearly enough. Not giving a flying fudge about what other people think about how you should live your life or build your business, nor should you be spending any of your precious life energy trying to conform to some made up standard about how big you should dream. Now, back in the day, we were all taught that we should get a good job, we should get a family, a house, you know, have some security and play it safe. That was the old American dream, really the old should. But these days, it's really starting to feel like dreaming big is the new should. That somehow if you're not dreaming big, you probably have small dream shame. That if you don't dream really, really huge, somehow you're not ambitious enough, you're not smart enough, and you're not valuable enough in this world. This idea is totally and absolutely not true. Small dream shame is total BS. And for so many people, dreaming big is actually crushing their soul. You want to know who's not a victim of small dream shame? My parents. My parents moved out to Vegas from New Jersey, and I recently went out there for a weekend visit. Now, their Vegas is not the Vegas that most people think of. So they're not living in some penthouse in the Mandalay Bay. They would never ever want that. They live in a quiet little residential neighborhood. Their house is so simple. Their life is so simple and they absolutely love it that way. They have no desire to eat at fancy places like Nobu. You want to know their favorite place in Vegas? It's a tiny little casino that has an amazing buffet and three people can eat for 20 bucks. Yes, 20 bucks. And they told me this probably about six times. It got them so excited and it got me excited for them. Now, world travel, traveling around the world, no interest at all. They do not want to be high rollers. They don't even gamble. You want to hear this one? They got themselves their own slot machine <laughs> and they filled it up with their own change so they can win what they already have. Now, some people may say, oh, that sounds crazy. I think it sounds amazing. They are so happy. They're not living small. They're living large. And it's so inspiring to me. I'm also inspired by this, even if it sounds a little morbid. In the top five regrets of the dying, author Bronnie Ware discovered this. The number one regret of the dying is wishing they had the courage to live the life they wanted to live, not the one others had expected of them. The bottom line is that we have to think and dream independently. Each of us comes to earth with our own unique assignment and each of our dreams, no matter the size or scope, is valuable and perfect exactly as is. So let's land this plane on a tweetable. Your dream doesn't have to be big to be perfect. Hi, Marie. I'm just about to turn 19. Even though I'm young, I have big dreams. Problem is, people keep telling me my dreams are not realistic and that I'm letting myself down. I was going to be a doctor and then decided that wasn't really what I wanted. Now, I want to be a professional event and party planner and grow my business into something huge that I can be proud of. How can I get past caring so much about what others think? Should I play it safe and get a degree in something that has a secure job at the end of it? What's your advice for young people just starting out in the business world? There's so much I don't know and your YouTube channel is really helping me. Thank you. Paige, these are awesome questions and I think it's something that all of us can relate to no matter what age we are. So the first thing I want to talk about is what you shared. Should I get a degree with a secure job at the end of it? So little reality check for you, my love. Those days are over. <laughs> There's really no such thing as a secure job anymore. Um, I think if you take a look around at what's happening in the world, you go into any Starbucks and you'll see some uh, lawyers and some stockbrokers networking out of there who would totally back me up on this. Paige, I know you said you want to start your own business and that's awesome, but for everyone else, even if you don't want to start your own business, hear me on this. Entrepreneurship is a mindset that everyone on the planet needs. If you want to thrive now and in the future, the only people that are going to really make it in this world are people that will take initiative, that will take action, and that think and behave like entrepreneurs. And one of the first and most important things about that is getting real comfortable with not giving a flying fudge what other people think about you. 
Let me take you back in my own life. I was only a few years older than you when I decided that I wanted to be a life coach. Now you gotta get this. This was back when no one even heard of a life coach. Those words life coach made as much sense to people as dream farmer or potato doctor. And exhale. You still getting baked? Just turn your head and cough for me. Plus, I was 23 years old. I mean, who in their right mind would hire a 23-year-old life coach? Even I was rolling my eyes at myself. The point is, don't let anyone's bullshit opinions or judgments about what you can't do, especially your own, stop you from following your dreams. You will never do anything great in your life if you've got this song stuck in your head. Judging us, they're judging you. They judge your every move and judging us, the judging you, judging us, they're judging you, judging you, judging you, judging you. Paige, you say you want to plan parties and events, so get to it, woman. Don't wait for people to give you permission or until you have some degree. Just find somebody who needs a party plan and plan the confetti out of it. And then you do another, and then another, and then another, and then all of a sudden... Mazel tov! You are a party planner. Now, in terms of education, I am 100% for education. In fact, I always advocate for people to be lifelong learners. But don't limit your education to only what you can learn in the classroom. You should consider getting a job or two with more established event planners so you can really learn about the industry from the inside out. And then there's one more thing, and this is my final and perhaps more important piece of advice. You've got to be really conscious of who you surround yourself with. you got to get rid of everybody who's negative and all the naysayers. So if that means getting some new friends, definitely do it. And you also want to feed yourself some really positive things to your mind and your body and your soul day after day. So I know you love Marie TV because it's a positive, wholesome, family kind of show. And of course, it's gluten free. So remember, keep surrounding yourself with positive people. In fact, you should find some people your age and get inspired by them. Everybody knows I'm a huge fan of Malala Yousafzai, who is your age, Paige. And there's also another incredibly inspiring young woman. Her name is Tavi Gebenson. You can find entrepreneur groups in your area. You can find them online. The bottom line here is that with the right support and the right attitude and a ton of action, you can create anything you desire. You know, one of your favorite quotes, um, again, while we were talking before the cameras went on, was about and from Amelia Earhart. So you want to tell us that story? Yeah, so there's the movie Amelia about Amelia Earhart. And um, at the end of the quote, like she's flying off into her death mm -hmm. and this like beautiful sunset or sunrise. And this was right around the time I was about, I had, I, this was the quote that inspired me to have the conversation with my mom. It was, um, as she's flying off into the sunset, it says, uh, you know, everyone has oceans to fly if they have the heart. Is it reckless? Yes. But what do dreams know of boundaries? And it was just like, I still just get chills like hearing that mm -hmm. because like that, that sums up the whole journey. Yeah. Like we all have it. We all can embrace it. And it's completely counterintuitive to everything that we've learned for our survival. And you know, yes. And you know, a lot of people will email me and when I write about that and go, well, Mastin, but she died. Right. And my response to them has always been, I would rather die living my dream than die a coward. And, you know, because no moment's guaranteed, you know. But for me, if, if living my dream and have wanting to, as Steve Jobs said, like, make a dent in the universe, like it requires you to face your death, metaphorically and literally. Absolutely. You know, and so I think that's the number one thing that holds people back is this like, if you can transcend your fear of death, you can accomplish a lot. It's awesome. So our Marie TV audience is incredibly interactive and they love to have great discussions. So I think that we should challenge everybody who's watching Sounds at good. home. Um, what is holding you back? Like, do you have this big dream? If you think about that quote, that beautiful Amelia Earhart quote, what's the dream that you want so bad? You know, and what could possibly be holding you back from it? You know, do you want any to share anything to challenge them to? We want you to put your comments below this video, by the way, because we want to have a discussion about this because I think it'll actually be really rich because I know when people start to think about this they're like 
I've coached many people and they're like, I, I buried that dream long ago. I didn't think that that was possible. I'm like, that's the thing that you need to go for. That's yeah. the thing you need to live for. That's yeah. the thing that'll bring you to life. Absolutely. I, I think that, you know, I mean, we talked about this, but it's really just about, you know, if, if you knew you were already dead and if you knew you had nothing to lose and if you knew anything was possible, what would you do? <laughs> hey there, real quick. If you're loving these tips, then you are gonna love my free audio coaching program even more. It's called How to Get Anything You Want. And inside, you're gonna learn three proven steps to turn any dream into reality. I am not kidding. You need to go download it now at marieforleo.com slash subscribe. That's marieforleo.com slash subscribe. I'll see you there. I want to start off with something that you shared in the introduction to your book, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. You shared, I come from a long line of women mm -hmm. who were forced into a life they never defined for themselves. Take us back to those early days in your village in Zimbabwe. I want folks to understand the picture of what life was like for you as a 14-year-old. Mm -hmm. You know, I always talk about um, coming from this long line of generations of women, women who had been denied the right to their dreams, the right to their education. I always visualized my great-grandmother when she was born. She was born into this race that she never defined. And she was born holding the baton, the baton of poverty, early marriage, illiteracy, a colonial system that never respected her. And she's running into this race with this baton. She runs so fast, she hands over this baton to my grandmother. My grandmother grabs that baton of poverty, illiteracy. She runs, she hands over that baton to my mother. My mother grabs that baton in a race that she never defined because of the circumstances. And she runs, runs, and she hands over that baton to me. I never wanted to be part of that baton. I found myself getting married at a very early age and having babies before I was even 18. I was a mother of four children without a high school education, with nothing. But all I wanted was an education. And when I talk about this baton of poverty that's being passed on, I also talk about the wisdom that is also passed on from generations before me. So in our lives, my grandmother used to say that you have the power to decide whether you keep on running with that baton of poverty, the baton of illiteracy, or you run with the baton of wisdom to rechange and reshift this baton so that you become the one who breaks the cycle of poverty, early marriage, lack of education, abuse, and all the ugly things in our lives. So when I was hardly 22 years of age, my country, we had just gained our independence because all along we had been colonized by the British. And here I was, a mother of four, and my country had gained that independence, and strangers started coming in, mm. Americans, Australians. And these were women who would come to the community. And there was this particular woman. She sat with me and with other women. And she asked me one question that I'll never forget in my life. What are your dreams? I never knew I'm supposed to have dreams because I was an abused woman, a silenced woman. Remember, I had four children, and actually one of the babies died as an infant because I failed to produce enough milk. I was a child myself, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, am I supposed to have dreams in my life? And other women started sharing their own dreams, and I was quiet. She looked at me, and she said, young woman, you haven't said anything. Tell me, what are your dreams? I couldn't bring my dreams. I knew I had these dreams in me, but for some reasons I couldn't because there was so much noise in my mind. I had been shaped to believe that I was nothing. 
And maybe it was the way she kept on looking at me, the way she nudged me to say something. And when I opened my mouth, I became a chatterbox. And I said, I want to go to America. I want to have an undergraduate degree. I want to have a master's. And I want to have a PhD. There was silence. The other women looked at me, and I could feel they were saying, are you crazy? How can that be? You don't even have a high school education. And I guess there was something about these American women when they were coming to my village. There was this sense of empowerment, sense of loving thyself. And I wanted that. I would see them getting into their backpacks and removing books or papers, and they would look at those books and open, and they would put on their glasses, spectacles, and they would talk to each other and put back those spectacles back into their bags. And I thought wearing glasses was a sign of education, and I wanted that. So when I talked about these degrees, I had heard these women talking about these degrees, and I wanted to have an education to change my life. And she looked at me and she said, yes, it is achievable. If you desire those dreams, if you desire to change your life, yes, Tinogona. Tinogona in my culture, in my language, it means it is achievable. I'd never heard of a woman declaring herself to believe they can achieve their own dreams. And when I left that place, I ran to my mother and I said, my mother, I have met someone who made me believe in my dreams. My mother looked at me and she said, Tererai, if you believe in what this stranger has said to you and you work hard and you achieve your dreams, not only are you defining who you are as a woman, you are defining every life and generations to come. And I knew at that moment that my mother was handing me an inheritance. My mother knew that I needed to be the one to break this vicious cycle of poverty that runs da so deep in my family and in the community. I needed to redefine the baton so that I would never pass on this baton to my own girls. I needed to get this education. So my mother said, Tererai, write down your dreams the same way, and bury them the same way we bury the umbilical cord, the birth cord. I come from a culture that believes so much in indigenous knowledge, ancient wisdom. When a child is born, the female elders of the community, they take that infant, they snip the umbilical cord, bury that umbilical cord deep down, under the ground with the belief that when this child goes, grows, wherever they go, whatever happens in their life, the umbilical cord will always remind them of their birthplace. Mm -hmm. So my mother said, if you write down your dreams and you bury those dreams, your dreams will always remind you of their importance that you need to redefine your life, that you need to break this cycle, that you need never to pass on this baton, this ugly baton of poverty, illiterate, early marriage. So I wrote down my dreams. Four, I want to go to America. I want to have an undergraduate. I want to have a master's and a PhD. And I was ready to bury those dreams deep down under the ground. When my mother said something so profound, which really has changed my life. She said, Tererai, I see you only have four dreams, personal dreams, but I want you to remember this. Your dreams in life will have greater meaning when they are tied to the betterment of your community. And I looked at my mother and I'm thinking, what does that even mean? <laughs> my mother repeated, your dreams in this life will have greater meaning when they are tied to the betterment of your community. I would end up 
writing down my fifth dream, number five. When I come back, I want to improve the lives of women and girls in my community so they don't have to go through what I had gone through in my life. I want to come back, create employment platforms for women. I want to come back, build schools so that girls, they won't be marginalized. And I buried my dreams. And it would take me eight years. And I call those eight freaking years. Yes, mama. <laughs> to gain my high school diploma because I was going through correspondence. I was uh, an adult. I couldn't fit into a classroom, so I would do correspondence. And my mother was very poor. I, I didn't get enough money to pay for my tuitions. I needed five subjects, classes, English, math, biology, history, and Bible knowledge or something. And we were still under the British system of education. So I would do my correspondence, two subjects at a time. Whenever my mother was able to sell ground nuts or any produce, she would give me $20, $40 to register for my classes. And I would write my exams and send these papers to a place called Cambridge. I had no idea where Cambridge is. And I would wait three to six months for that brown envelope from Cambridge to come. And I would open that envelope and I would realize I have a U ungraded. I have an F failure. And I would go back to my mother. She would give me more money and I would write again and wait another six months. I open that brown envelope. I have a U ungraded. I have a failure. And I would go back and I would wait and write and wait. And finally, I opened that brown envelope from Cambridge. I had a B and I had an A. I never gave up. Eight years, yes. I never gave up because I knew I was on a journey to redefine my life. I knew I had what it takes to achieve my own dreams in this life. Yes. And then after eight years, I would find myself at Oklahoma State University. And I did my undergraduate in agriculture. I mean, even just pausing there for a moment, there's so many things to underscore and highlight that I am so moved by your spirit and your vision and your heart and your tenacity. Mm. I mean, when you buried those beautiful dreams in the can and you put yeah. them under the rock, mm. you were still in poverty. Oh, yeah. You were a, a mom with an abusive husband. Yes. Yes. And you did those correspondence courses for those eight freaking oh, years. Yeah. Yeah. And then to get yourself over to university here in the States, as you wrote, you came over with money strapped to your waist. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that wasn't yeah. even... It was still a long journey after oh, that. it was. So before we go on to that piece of the journey, I just want to highlight your incredible, precious mom. I feel like you and I share oh. something, you know, my mom was the one that taught me everything is figure outable. Yes. And your mom was that touchstone that oh, said, yeah. you deserve to dream. Yeah. yeah. The wisdom that she had mm. in terms of your fifth dream, yeah. it feels like that was really that changed everything. Mm, it, it, it does. And I think in many ways um, uh, she was pointing to the secret to our success that is not about the education. Mm. It's not about the personal goals. Yes. Neither is it about the personal financial goals, yes. but it is about how our education and how our personal goals are connected to the greater good. Yes. That's what makes humanity. That's what makes who we are yes. as a people. Yes. And so my, my grandmother would always say to me and my mother, you have the power within it's not your past that's going to define who you are, but it's what you believe about yourself. It's what you believe about your own expectations. What is it that you expect from yourself? Yes. And she would tell me, my mother, that 
you go to that place where you buried your dreams, you visualize the life as you think it should be. Mm. So I would spend hours and hours sitting in that same place, visualizing myself getting into an aeroplane. Mm. I'd never been in an aeroplane in my life. And I'd never seen one. The only aeroplane that I knew were the helicopters that would fly during the war because I was born and raised in a war-torn country. Yes. And I would visualize myself sitting into that helicopter, imagining myself flying to this place called America. And I would see these tall buildings. And my grandmother would say, Feel those mental images. See those buildings. And I, would, and I would see them and I would even smell the, the life that I wanted. And so when I got onto that aeroplane, there was this deja vu. I think I've been here before. Even when I arrived on campus... I felt I've been in this place before because I had spent so much of my time wanting to change my life and so much of my time visualizing this life that I wanted, visualizing this life that I was not going to pass on this baton to my, to my girls and I, and I wanted to, to change it all. So when I started my classes, I, I found pure joy. I was always the oldest student in any class that I've taken and sometimes older than the professor <laughs> herself or yes. himself. Yes. But I never cared because I knew I had the power yes. to change my life. Yes. And your life when you got here was still wrought with so much challenge. Mm. You, I remember when I first learned about your story in Half the Sky yeah. from Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl yeah. Houdon, where you were feeding yourself out of oh, yeah. trash cans. Oh, yeah. Your children were cold. Oh, yeah. The husband that was abusive for a mm. period of time, he was still here. Yeah. It, you know, because uh, Zimbabwe, where yes. I was coming from, yes. the weather is different. Yes. And uh, there's always this community cohesion you can have. Your kids, you know, you can live your kids with your neighbors and what have you. Yes. And now I'm in a different country. And um, I, I didn't have a scholarship. Yes. I would work three jobs uh, to feed the children and still taking classes. And I remember when my kids, when they arrived in the U.S., uh, three months down the road, as they were brushing their teeth, uh, I, I saw their gums were bleeding, mm -hmm. and I knew they were missing fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Back home, you can grow your fruits and vegetables, and they grow because it is the, the, the tropics, yes. I mean. And uh, in America, fruits and vegetables are a little bit expensive. Yes. So I would many, many times would go to bed hungry. And I went back to the university, and I said, you know, I have a dream, but I'm about to give up. I can't see my children suffering. It's one thing for me to have this great dream, yes. but it's another to see my kids suffering. And fortunate enough, the university said, they, they are local stores here. I hope they don't mind, or you don't mind, um, if they give you leftover fruits and vegetables. And I said, no, I don't mind. So we went to this local store, the manager looks at me and said, oh, no, no, in this country, if we give you these leftover fruits and vegetables and if anything happens to your kids after they have consumed them, you end up suing us. Yes. And I said, I have no dime to sue anyone. Mm -hmm. Please, please, I need to feed the children. And the store manager says, okay, here's a deal. You make sure that I'm not going to hand over the fruits to you. I'm going to put them, pack them in a cardboard box and um, I'm going to place the cardboard box outside the store yes. near the trash can. Make sure that at four o'clock every day, you come and pick that box. Mm. If you are late, we are going to throw the box into the trash can. 99% I was late to that cardboard box because <laughs> 
I had to work three jobs, take care of five kids, and I would find the box straight dumped into the trash can. Some of the fruits have already spilled over, and I would collect everything, wash, and go and feed my children and ask myself, who am I to even complain that I live in a trailer house in Oklahoma? It's a dilapidated trailer house. There is no air condition. Everything is just falling apart. Who am I to complain when I know there are thousands of women and individuals that I see every day on the streets in Western countries? Who am I to complain? And who am I even to say I'm feeding my children from trash cans when I know where I'm coming from in sub-Saharan Africa, millions of Homeless kids are feeding from trash cans that no one is washing. At least the American trash can, someone washes it. Those thoughts grounded me because I knew at the end of the tunnel, despite its darkness, there was light. Yes. And I knew I had the solutions in me. So... I graduated my master's in plant pathology and um, told myself I wasn't going for my PhD. I needed to work. Mm. It was too much. I needed to work. Uh, I, I needed to give a better life for my children. And uh, I applied for a job, um, got accepted uh, at some place in Arkansas, Little Rock, and uh, I went for the interview, and um, one day I'm I'm walking in the in the corridor, and I meet this woman, and she looks at me, and she said, "I think I know you," and I am thinking, <laughs> "I've met me, I've met many Americans and many white women." I don't know. She said, I really think I know you. Yes. And I am thinking, gosh, who is this woman? And then it dawned on me that, oh my gosh, that's the very woman that I had met some 14 years back in my village. The one who had inspired me to believe in my dreams. The one who had never seen the poverty in me, the smallness in me. My giant, my champion, the one who said, yes, Tinogona, you can achieve your dreams if you believe in your dreams. And that was Jolak. Yes. And now she is the CEO and president of Hefa International, this organization that has just that had just employed me. Mm. And I am thinking, the universe, the universe has a way to honor our dreams if only we believe and we become determined and work hard yes. towards our own goals. And so my first trip home, I went to that place where I had buried my dreams, dug them up, and I could see that list and check going to America, check undergraduate, check masters. And I could see two dreams still looking at me yes. and saying, so what? And I said, I have the solution for you. <laughs> and I reburied those dreams and came back to the United States of America and enrolled myself at Western Michigan University for my PhD. And I, I remember the day that I graduated and I was walking that podium to receive my PhD, that paper that now says you are a PhD holder, you are now Dr. Trent. And and I realized it had taken me 20 years from the day that I buried my dreams to the day that I was now going to receive my PhD. And I, as I was walking that podium to receive that paper, I really felt 
like a lawyer who addressed her case to the world, mm. to say if we believe in our dreams, yes, we can achieve. But also to say if we believe in the dreams of others and create platforms for their opportunities, yes, they can achieve their dreams. Because as I reflect back, it wasn't because of my intelligence, but it was more because of the opportunities that I had been given in life. And I think that drives everything that I do today to realize that I stand on the shoulders of others. I stand on the shoulders of giants, of champions. And I have a moral obligation, a sacred obligation to allow young women, to allow girls, to allow individuals to stand on my shoulders because if it wasn't for the shoulders of others, I wouldn't even be sitting here with Marie Folio. I can't even, Mama. I'm going to run over and hug you right now. You this, you talk about that great hunger. And yeah. I know there are so many people watching right now. I was talking with a woman earlier today who, and I was thinking about the beauty of your book, where the global silencing of women's voices, mm, mm. where they don't feel they have that permission to dream, mm. and whether it is from familial trauma, sexual trauma, cultural trauma, of not knowing that they have a right to dream. Yeah. yeah. And that, that hunger inside of them is so healing. Like yeah. when I look at you, you have been an inspiration to me for so long. Oh, thank you. And just the beauty of your words and what you bring to people. Mm. What do you have to say to anyone watching right now if they are, first of all, I know they're going to be deeply moved and inspired by your story, but if they themselves are having trouble identifying that great hunger in mm. their hearts, mm. what mm. would you say? Mm. You know, we all have hunger. Yeah. Some they call it passion, yeah. but I prefer hunger because I realize there are two kinds of hungers in our lives. There is the little hunger. The little hunger is all about, I want it now, immediate gratification. Yes. But the great hunger, the greatest of all hungers, which is the hunger that we all have, is hunger for a meaningful life. Yes. How do you then tap into that hunger? Because it is within us. You ask yourself, what breaks my heart? What breaks my heart? Because it is in those moments of our brokenness, in those moments that we, re we realize that it's not our past, it's not the challenges in front of us. Once we realize that, we have the power to find that solution within us. We begin to hear the stirring in our own heart, pointing us to something greater than who we are. And we find the answer to that great hunger. Yes. But we have to be more intentional. Yes. Hi, Marie. I'm a 16-year-old boy, and though I know I'm not part of your typical demographic, I absolutely love your advice and videos. Here's my problem. I'm enthusiastic and ambitious, but lately I've been stuck in this negative mindset due to the fact I never get anything done. I love trying new things and going out of my comfort zone, but I never follow through. I get extremely motivated to start something as if my life is going to change and I'm going to become a new person, but the excitement dies and eventually I lose interest. This has become such a problem that it's affecting my confidence. I've stopped feeling like I can accomplish anything and also stopped trying new things. How can I follow through with something I've started without losing interest? Thanks, Spencer. Great question, Spencer. And by the way, I am so honored that you love and that you watch Marie TV. Just so you know, people of all age groups from 193 countries around the world watch Marie TV, so you are in good company. So here's the thing, Spence. By the way, can I call you Spence? 
you don't have a problem, young man. You have a gift and you haven't been taught yet how to fully leverage it. Here's the thing, you are creative, you're a risk taker, you love life, you're ambitious. Those are all beautiful things. I suspect you may be a little bit like me, someone who's multi-passionate. So you get very excited about life and at times you can feel a little ADD. Now here's the thing, the world's greatest artists and thinkers and entrepreneurs also share this gift, so I want you to be grateful that you have it. Now this gift you have, which is really a strength, also has its dark side too, which you're experiencing right now. And I can really relate to this because I've been frustrated in the same exact way. The good news is I have a lot to say on this topic and I really think we can help you, so let's dive right in. First thing I wanna talk about is permission to dabble. So wandering time, play time, just checking things out. That's not always a bad thing. You have to understand that dabbling around can fuel your creativity, can really feed your soul. I understand that you wanna learn how to follow through and we will get to that, but I wanna make sure that you don't lose this miraculous sense of curiosity that you have because it's really important. And to help you remember, here's a little PSA from the Armed Forces. Private, do you like to try new things? Ma'am, yes, ma'am. Does everything you try have to change your life? Ma'am, no, ma'am. What does clarity come from, Private? Engagement, ma'am. Does it come from thought? Ma'am, no, ma'am. Dabbling is a form of engagement, Private. Permission to dabble, ma'am? Permission granted, you little maggot. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, I had onions for lunch. I could tell, ma'am. You heard Private Jams, clarity comes from engagement, not thought, and you do have permission to dabble. So here's the thing, Spence, you just gotta set up some clear dabble time, meaning you get to try out all kinds of things and you're not gonna pressure yourself to follow through. So remember this, if it's dabble time, you have permission to dabble. Next, I want you to crank your CogCon, which is not to be confused with shake your bonbon. CogCon is just a Mariafied way of saying your cognitive control, your ability to manage your attention. Now, researchers have found that this singular mental ability predicts success and happiness in school, work, and life. Now, here's the thing, Spence. At 16 years old, it's probably true that your cognitive control is not as strong as it's gonna be in a few years, but here's the thing, you do not have to wait around for this thing to naturally get better. There are three steps that you can take that'll not only crank your CogCon, but it'll help you build focus habits that'll serve you for life. Step one is meditate on the daily. So Dr. Adam Gazelli from the University of California calls meditation a cognitive control exercise that enhances our ability to self-regulate internal distractions. While you're free to find your own practice, 10 minutes a day for me works miracles. Step number two is define completion. So Spencer, once you've had dabble time and you figure out you really wanna to move to completion on a project, you have to define exactly what that looks like. So for example, let's say you wanna learn how to animate. So would completion be being able to animate a full length feature for Pixar films? Probably not. You might wanna set completion as something like being able to animate a one minute video that you can upload and show your friends. When you define what completion looks like in advance, you make following through a lot more attainable. Step number three, you wanna practice wearing blinders. So they often put blinders on racehorses to help them stay focused and not get distracted. And we human beings can do the same thing for ourselves. You have to train yourself to have a one track mind. And it's easier said than done. But here's the thing, if you find yourself getting distracted and wanting to jump over to another project, I want you to let this question be your guide and your blinders. Is what I'm doing right now moving me towards completion? Finally, a little bonus on follow through. Now, if you haven't seen our other episode all about following through, you should really watch it because it's awesome. Okay, Spence, let's wrap this up with a tweetable. Creative success means balancing your love of starting things with a habit of finishing them. Dear wonderful Marie, here's the sitch. I'm in my mid thirties, God help me, how did that happen? And took a huge risk in my mid twenties to pursue what I always wanted to live in Europe and turn my scientific career into one focused on mainstream media. And then 
What was wonderful became a nightmare, which included the death of my boss and my work environment became extremely toxic. I left, encouraged by all to take a position back in North America for a prestigious government agency. Looking back, I realized I never wanted this new job, but now I'm here and hating it. I should have listened to my heart and volunteered for Habitat for Humanity in Malaysia instead. I would have had no money, but have been so happy. If I leave now, the people who hired me have a lot of clout and can make sure I never work in this field again. How can I reconcile my true calling and do what's right for me with possibly destroying some very influential connections? Thanks so much. Warmest, Mariah. Mariah, this is an awesome question, something all of us can relate to. I mean, we'll all find ourselves at crossroads in our own life, and we can often struggle with. Do we take the safe road or do we follow our heart, which can often feel a lot riskier, at least in our minds? Now, there's two important things I wanna talk about today with you. The first is about burning bridges, and what I wanna tell you is a tweetable. What's highest and best for you is always what's highest and best for everyone around you. I guarantee that by hating your job, you are not doing your influential connections any favors. In fact, you're probably doing more harm to your reputation than if you left. Telling the truth always wins. Now, as it relates to leaving your job, of course, you got to do this in the right way and take full responsibility for what you're about to do. It's one thing to send your boss a text like, I'm going to Malaysia to build houses. Peace in your crease. It's another to set up a proper meeting and really co-create a game plan so you're not leaving everybody in a lurch. But the second and more important thing I wanna talk about today is a crucial test that'll help you make the right decisions every time, especially when they're huge decisions, just like this one. Mariah, one of the first things you said is, I'm in my mid thirties, how did that happen? It happened because it happens. The next thing you know, you're gonna be saying, oh my God, I'm in my 60s, how did that happen? You gotta realize, as you get older, time goes by faster and faster, and before you know it, you're gonna be 80 like that. So here's what you gotta do. You gotta sit yourself down right now and do the 10-year test. Ask yourself, 10 years from now, will you regret not doing this? Whether it's moving to Malaysia or changing careers or starting your own business, really imagine your future self, you 10 years from now. Will you regret not following your heart? I'll tell you one thing you will regret, not moisturizing. Trust me, you're welcome. But back to the big things. I did the 10-year test when I was 25 and trying to figure out if I should pursue dance as a profession. Now, you got to realize I was broke. I had hardly any dance training. And sadly, 25 is over the hill in the dance world. So I sat myself down and I said, Marie, when you're 35, will you regret not having gone for this whole hip hop thing? And in a nanosecond, my answer was, hell yes, I'll regret it. In that moment, all wishy-washiness went away. I got focused and I kicked some serious dance ass. Best decision of my life. And yet another opportunity to show you this. But seriously, for the love of all things holy, trust me when I say life is short and it's getting shorter by the minute. You must do the thing you're dreaming of and you must do it now. I believe we all have a direct line to the divine and the call comes through our heart. I'm sorry, I thought I put that thing on vibrate. Oh, voicemail. Hey, you guys, can we hear that? Mariah, you should follow your heart and ditch that poopy job. Know this coming from someone who takes a lot of risks. What you can produce in 10 years will absolutely astound you, but you have to start now. And the other thing is, I have never, ever, ever met anyone who's regretted following their heart. You know, the Marie TV audience has been growing. It's not just the ladies that love us, not love my ladies, but there's also some fellas out there. I know you won't admit it, but you love us too. And more exciting than that, there's a lot of moms who are starting to watch Marie TV with their kids. So I've been hearing about that a lot. And then I got this email. Hi, I'm Olivia. I'm 12 years old and I live in New Zealand and I'm just just beginning beginning to create create my my own own digital digital publishing publishing company as an author and illustrator. I've just signed up for your B-School free videos. I don't need to have a Facebook page, so I can't post that way yet. 
I may start one when I know what to do with it. I think your videos are very inspiring. I've started to learn marketing now. Your videos are very helpful in this area. And also how to get the right audience to notice and buy my products. I would love my books to touch people's hearts and really inspire them like these videos inspired me a few seconds ago. Thank you, Olivia. Smiley face. When that email came in, it absolutely filled my heart and I knew I needed to know more about who this amazing young viewer was. Turns out she made a video for us. Take a look. Hi, I'm Olivia Lee. It is blowing a gale outside. But you know what rainy days are good for? Drawing. My other favorite thing about a windy and rainy day is that it's perfect for writing. Welcome to my room. This is my office. That's my bed. And if you ask me, every single office should have a bed. All right. Oh, it was so hard. After a hard day's typing, the best thing is grabbing a good book and flopping back on your office bed and reading it. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have stuff to catch up on. So, Miss Olivia has quite a few things to say about creativity, about writing, and about following your dreams. So, we're going to talk with her right now via Skype. All right, everyone, so I am here with the amazing Olivia, and I am so grateful. It's afternoon here in New York City, and Olivia, I know it's the morning for you, right? Yeah, it is, actually. <laughs> about 8.30. 8.30. Awesome. So um, tell us a little bit more about your inspiration to create books and to write stories and to just start your own business. Well, ever since I was little, I ever since I could hold a pen, I've been drawing out my own stories, like... I had, uh, like, I'd get a piece of paper and a pen, and I'd have an idea for a story, and instead of, like, writing it with words, I'd draw the pictures for it, each scene. Sometimes I'd have entire chapters just with just drawings in them, with little speech bubbles. And uh, a little later, I was encouraged to maybe write down the words and then put the pictures with it. So it sort of, it grew from that in a way. And then uh, once I figured out how to get past the where's the letters on the keyboard stage, uh, it got a lot easier to type and I was able to uh, do stories a little bit more properly and add the pictures with them and it, and it grew from there. So yeah, that's pretty much how it happened. That's awesome. And so did you start drawing just on pencil and paper or were you drawing on the computer? Well, I do like to draw on computer programs, but when, when, when I started, I was always, I was always had a pencil and a paper, and I found it really difficult to draw with a pen, but now I really like drawing with pens, and it, you know, it's just stuff like that, but I, yeah, I did a lot of pencil drawings, and uh, I would just draw and draw and draw, and eventually I had huge piles of just paper with lots of drawings on them, and you can so you can still find boxes in our house with just these big boxes full of paper with drawings on them from however, however old I was. That's awesome. I actually started, um, that was one of the first things that I learned how to do when I was little, and it was one of my favorite activities. And for a while, I thought I was going to be a fine artist. So I loved drawing just as much, it sounds like, as you do. So curious, do any of your friends have their own business? And what do they think about you starting your own publishing company? Well, none of my friends my age currently have their own businesses, but they are really supportive when I tell them about it. Like, I'll tell them that I did something new on my website or that I've done up a new set of tweets or something like that, yeah. and they are so supportive. They'll go, oh, wow, I can't wait to see it, or, and, or something like that, and they're really encouraging, really supportive. They're great friends. That's awesome. And I, I do have some adult friends, though, who do run their own businesses, and the ones I've told are also really supportive, so everyone rocks. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And so have you met your adult friends through your parents or through friends of your parents? Is that how you got in touch? Well, yeah, pretty much. I mean, um, we, we're around the same area, and so we, uh, 
we know them from around here and we meet them, we catch up quite a lot. So, yeah, we, we spend a lot of time around each other. So we do get to talk about that sort of stuff actually quite a lot. That's so great. I love hearing that. Um, so next thing I want to ask you, because I think it's true for any entrepreneur, when you run into challenges, whether it's creative challenges and you're working on a story or it comes more to the technical side of your business, how do you handle those challenges? Who do you go to to ask for, for help? Well, there's definitely mom and dad. They are really helpful with business, lots of stuff like my dad might help me with the tax and things because that's always fun. Yes. Um, but there's... There's Auntie Google and Cousin YouTube. They're <laughs> my favorites. They're, my favorites. They're really, they're really helpful. It's um, with Google because I might be needing to do some research on a time period in a book I'm working on, and I'll go to Google, and I had a really weird thing I needed to look up, and actually, it's surprisingly helpful. <laughs> you know. And with YouTube, I might have a book that needs a certain style of drawing. Yeah. And it's really hard to do that particular style, or maybe I just don't know it, or I've never even heard of it, or something like that. Yes. So I'll look it up on YouTube, or I'll, or I'll get it help to find it. And I'll just watch um, an artist who knows how to do it, and practice. And it's, it's really, really helpful. Yeah. Isn't it just amazing the time that we live in that you can just go online and whether you want information, education, or inspiration, it's just all at your fingertips. And the thing I love about you, Olivia, is that you get this on such a level. It's like, this is just how you think. And I can't tell you how excited I am for you because at 12 years old, right, and you're almost 13, what you're going to be able to create in your life is just so miraculous. And you're such an inspiration to me. The fact that you're getting started this young, I just think it's fantastic. So um, thanks for sharing with us a little bit of how you overcome your challenges with, uh, what do you call them? Is it Uncle Google and Auntie YouTube or did I get that switched up? It's Auntie Google and Cousin YouTube. Oh, love it. Love it, love it, love it. So um, next thing I want to ask you as we're kind of wrapping this up, one of the reasons I wanted to interview you was because I so admire your ambition and the fact that you had dreams and you had dreams around creating stories and creating books and you just take action and as I always say, everything is figure outable. So I know so many people in our audience of all ages have a dream of having their own book and putting their ideas out into the world. So what would you say to someone who's just starting out? Any tips for them? Well. I do have uh, a few tips that I would definitely give to a person like that. Uh, I've got, well, seven, uh, no, five, actually. Five Love tips. It. Love it. My first one is that you should just start and write regularly. Because if you if you have a schedule and you just continue to, you know, chunk through it, yes. then you'll, you'll get through it, you know, you'll finish it. If you don't, then, well, you won't. Yes. Let me ask you, before you go on to your next tip, do you have a regular writing schedule for yourself? Well, I do. Tr I had a little period where I was writing and writing and writing. It was going really well. Yes. Then I finished the first draft of the book, and I took a break, and I found that now I've got a great drawing spirit, so I'm going for that. Yes. So sometimes it just I'm taking turns with it, uh, yes. writing, drawing, writing, drawing. So it's that's sort of how it works personally for me. I love that and I actually find that to be very true as well. Like when you get those creative bursts, as long as you're consistent with whatever it is that you want to create, it works well. So yeah, let's go on to your second tip. All right, well my second one is it's really easy to publish your own book online in today's world. I mean because on Amazon, Apple, Kobo and all of the other ones have free guides that you can just follow the instructions of and you'll find it really easy to just, you know, get it up there. It's really great. Yes. Yeah. My third one is that make sure your cover is actually, it looks really cool, make sure it looks really good, and that your title is really importantly, really easy to read when it's the size of a thumbnail online. Yes. It's really small. So this uh, is big. Yeah. Olivia, I think that this is such a huge tip, and I'm so glad that mm. you brought it up. So the idea of not only having your cover be really good, but having your title be really good and most importantly that when it's that tiny as a thumbnail that it's still attractive and it still connects. Um, 
I was reading this article about a woman in, I believe it was Forbes. She started selling vintage clothing online um, using eBay. And one of the things that she discovered, by the way, she started off doing this like just in her house. And now her company, I think, is doing about $129 million a year in revenue. All from one of her biggest things was making sure that the pictures look really good when they're tiny. And she said that's one of the tips that most people don't get. So I just love how wicked smart you are that you got that already. So that's huge. Thanks for that. Thank you very much. Uh, my fourth one is that publishing is really easy, but you still need a really good book. Because yes. if, you, if you skip on the quality, what happens if someone picks up that book and goes, ooh, interesting, reads it, and they go, uh... They don't really like it if it's really bad. Right. Then, um, well, then any other books that, that your no that your name is associated with or that you've written, they'll probably assume that they're really bad as well. So you shouldn't really skimp on the quality of the book. Give it your best and the cover and everything. Just yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you. You know, you're talking about something that we talk about in our B school program. And it's this strategy I talk about, I call it the Happy Meal Mistake, where people will put out kind of crap stuff on their website and then expect people to want to pay them really good money for some of their other training or their programs. And it's kind of like, you know, if someone took you on a date to McDonald's and got you a Happy Meal, would you ever really expect them to go flying you off to Paris or some romantic weekend? <laughs> Probably not. So it's like you're talking about in the book world, right? Not wanting to make the Happy Meal mistake. Do you like this tip? I really like that tip. <laughs> so you're like in your what you're saying is with your book. It's like you don't want to put out a Happy Meal book, right? That's like kind of low quality, and no one's gonna to want to come back for a gourmet dinner. Oh, that's really funny. Uh, my uh, fifth tip is that if you should celebrate every milestone. When you finish your first draft, because that's a really big accomplishment, I mean, you've gotten to the end of something, relatively. So, um, you should celebrate. Just, well, whatever tickles your fancy, just celebrate in a way. And when you finish your edit, edit, you should celebrate that. And when you finally publish it, you should also celebrate. Like, my family, when we uh, finish the first edit of a book, we'll, we'll often go to a beach. And we have this little, little, uh... We, a recently made tradition that we have where we go to a beach, we just get something yummy to eat, and then we do a dance. For some reason, we do a dance. Yeah. I don't <laughs> know why. It is, it's, it's fun. fun. Yes. yes. That's right, because it makes you feel alive. And that's like, what better way to hang out and celebrate with your family than to dance around and be goofy and enjoy each other's company? I think that's awesome. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. That's really cool. Olivia, I just think you are fantastic. And I want to, first of all, thank you for writing us that email months ago, letting us know uh, what a difference our videos make. And I just adore you. I think you're fantastic. Your parents are great. So please send them my best. And, I will. Uh, yeah, you got to keep us up to date. And I know right now everyone watching this Marie TV episode, they'll be very, very inspired. And a lot of moms also watch with their daughters and I'm sure their sons too. So you're uh, providing a great example to many, many, many folks in our audience. So thank you for that. So what's happening right now? And we'll see if we can be even more helpful. So just a bit of background. So I, work, I currently work in consultancy, like I've been working for the past few years. Mm -hmm. And during my whole life, I wanted to start my own business. And even like all my friends always say, oh, you keep saying you want to start your business. And so just do it. But and I have so many different ideas. I've even when I travel to work, I just keep like dreaming and having ideas how to improve people's lives. But I feel like something is holding me back and I'm scared that. This is my anxiety and lack of confidence. Mm -hmm. That is like, um, uh, it's the reason why I keep snoozing my dreams. And um, I feel like I'm not ex expert in anything just because the consulting is a bit a broad term. So you help with different projects and different stuff. Sure. But I feel like I've learned a lot. 
And um, I'm really keen to start something, but I feel like my confidence and anxiety are the reasons why I'm not starting. And my, my question that I ask myself every day is, how can I build up my self-confidence and how can I get better at taking risks? Because yeah. starting in your business is a bit like, should I start or should I keep my full-time job that is giving me some sort of security yes. or should I just go and see as what's going to happen and if it's not successful um you know i'm always like trying to see the pros and cons and sometimes i feel like because i don't believe in myself enough to start something and say yeah i'm just i believe in my idea and i will do it even if if it fails at least i'm going to learn something yeah so yeah. i hear you and i actually i think that focusing on your confidence and risk taking is not going to be a fruitful path. Now, I'm going to tell you what I think is a fruitful path. I have an option, but there are many, many, many options. So here's my answer for you, my love. Since you've never started a business before, but based on how you're talking about it and how excited you get and, you, oh my goodness, you have so many ideas and you've been talking about this for years, part of what the challenge is for you, I don't think you have a group of friends or any type of structure to help you actually start a business. It's kind of like thinking, oh my goodness, I really want to learn how to dance or I really want to play a particular sport, but it feels so overwhelming if you've never actually done it before or if you don't have a bunch of people who are really experienced in that kind of dance or playing that particular sport, it's just all overwhelming. And then so all you do is spend all day thinking like, well, why am I not confident enough to just start or how do I get started? And obviously starting a business is a little different because there are financial implications, there are implications around yeah. scarcity and survival and your career and your identity and all these things. So here's my recommendation. Girl, you need some structure and you need a community. So obviously, I don't know how long you've been um, kind of engaging with our work, but we have a program called B-School that if it's the right fit yeah. for you, yeah. you should join the next time it comes around. But even if that's not right for you, we need to get you into an environment and get you some structure so that you can take all these beautiful ideas that you have and start putting them through some tests so that you can validate and understand, well, which of these ideas has the most highest chance for success and which doesn't? How can I dip my toe in the water? and start testing ideas even before I want to leave my job. By the way, one of the things that you might have found out from watching some of our past shows with Marie TV, I'm really not a huge fan for most people of just like quitting their full-time job and starting a yeah. business unless they yeah. are just so clear internally and externally that this is what they must do. In fact, there's some studies out there yeah. that say we're actually 33% less likely to fail if we keep our full-time job and we start a business on the side. So there's some research to back up the slow and steady approach. But most importantly, I think you need structure and you need community. It's so much easier to enter a new world when you have other people to talk to, other people that are on the path, that have either done it before or they're doing it now, people that you can connect with and that can share the journey with you. So again, I'll invite you to take a look at B-School whenever that's available next, but there could be local programs that you can find, other opportunities to get yourself around an entrepreneurial environment, and then some type of commitment where you can put some skin in the game, which is why I like B-School, um, so that you've got a reason to show up so that you have something that can help you take these beautiful ideas that are in your mind and actually put them into practice and start actually seeing results. Clarity comes from engagement, not thought, right? Like, is this idea gonna work? Well, let's test it, let's find out. And if it doesn't work, doesn't mean you're a failure, you're not supposed to be an entrepreneur, it just may mean you had the wrong idea or the wrong market picked out, all kinds of good stuff. Um, but that's my suggestion for you. I, I don't think you should focus on trying to build your confidence or trying to learn how to take better risks. I think you need to get yourself some structure and a community, and that'll handle 90% of it. Yeah, I think that's very important. And I've always thought that because I live in London, and London is, like, really easy. There are so many different events that yes. I can just say that are actually just much more, like, into uh, entrepreneurship and business building and I just I don't know if it's an excuse or it's just I can't find time to get but yeah I think you're very right that I just need to start talking with different people and this will build a lot and make myself more clear about what's going on around and 
That's right. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you mentioned something like, I don't know if it's an excuse. You know, one of the ideas I live my life by, if it's important to me, I'll make the time. If not, I'll make an excuse. And one of the ways that yeah, we that's... know what's really important in our lives is actually how we're spending our time. So without judgment or without self-beration, you know, you might want to just take a look at your calendar and say, well, how much time am I devoting to this entrepreneurship thing that I say is so important to me? And if you find that it's little to none besides just talking to yourself, about it in your mind, you might want to take a step back and go, huh, is it really that important to me? And if so, I need to start aligning what I say is important with my actions in the real world on a consistent basis. And by the way, if it's not what you want to do anymore, that's cool too. Entrepreneurship is amazing, but it's not for everyone. What is important is that you know it's important to you and that you're spending your time and your energy every single day in alignment with your dreams. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was so helpful and completely changed the way I see things. And I'm not just saying it Aww. just because it's you. It's honestly, it's just changed completely the way I see things. Good. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're so welcome. And we'll keep us posted and we'll be here for you. We'll be here to support you. We'd love to hear how it's coming along on your journey. Thank you very much. Thank you and wish you all the best. Yes. Bye, Raleigh. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. So sweet. I also agree with her because the first thing that when I heard that is I was like, oh, she needs to do some esteemable acts and build her confidence up. So I love that you offered the exact flip side to that because like when I struggle with that personally, I'm like, okay, if I'm feeling lackluster, my confidence has subsided or faded away, maybe I need to be doing some things that are going to boost build it. My, boost it a little yeah. bit. But your take on that of surrounding yourself and establishing community and structure is something I've never thought about. And I'm like, wow, imagine all these ideas floating in my head. Mm -hmm. If I just had a friend or a community to just throw them out to and hear them back, imagine what could be possible after that. Well, I think what's really cool, and I always go back to fitness analogies because I feel like they're very applicable to almost every area of our life. You know, mm -hmm. like you can be like, oh, I'm going to do a workout today. And yeah, you could do it from your house. But the moment you put yourself in a group fitness class mm -hmm. and there's all these other people around mm -hmm. and there's an instructor that's taking you through specific steps, you're like, oh, I can do this. All of a sudden, rather than doing like a 15 minute kind of shitty workout, you're doing this hour long thing that, yeah, you might be out of breath, but you're like, oh my God, I did it. So yeah. the power of community and the power of surrounding ourselves and having some kind of structure, again, um, for Raleigh, if you're still listening, or even for you, it's like, that's why I created B-School, because people need something that's step-by-step. -step. Again, if you're not into B-School, cool, but you can find another program that actually teaches you the baselines of business so you understand how to think about it, what you need to test, the things you need to do first, second, third, and fourth to give yourself the highest chances of success. No one has a business crystal ball, right? Mm -hmm. No one can predict what's going to work and what's not going to work, but there are timeless principles that if you follow them, you're going to give yourself a much higher success um, rate than if you don't. Oh my goodness, you made it all the way to the end. Good on you. But let's not stop here. Keep the momentum going. You're going to love this next episode. Click it, watch it now, and I'll catch you there. You get about 4,000 weeks to live, and you've likely already lived a significant portion of that. What specifically do you want to do with the time you've got left?